And now the pipes are rattling here on two as Rich Lorden chats with John Riley and Gerard Barry on BBC Theme Nights. Uh, shall I start, John, or do you want to? You, you, you go, Gerard, yes. I'm Gerard Barry and I'm a television producer. I have been for quite a while. Um, and I don't think I met John on Weird Night, but certainly that was maybe the first thing we did together. Oh, we Probably. did. That's where we met. Right, okay. And that would have been like 1992, maybe? Four. Four. So you, you see that detail isn't my thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of really odd and interesting because at that point in the world, you know, with only however many channels there were, like not the, you know, not the, the kind of plethora there are now, you could sort of assume both an audience and then assume that audience would do new things with you. Um, and it was, you know, part of making a sort of big splash that you'd have these, um, you know, great long chunks of programming that would last, you know, like, I don't know how long even Weird Night was, like it was like 12 or something hours. And BBC Two would let you do that because, it, you know, it drew attention to the network. There wasn't much else going on. You know, it was like bank holidays, that sort of thing when, you know, it was kind of um, when, you know, fresh programming was, was um, difficult for them. So they would just let you go ahead and do this stuff. And, and it literally, you know, it seems like a dream now, but you could kind of just sit there and say, there isn't much, you know, uh, here's this kind of Fortean Times thing. You don't really see that on telly, do you? And that would go very quickly up to Channel Controller, who's then Michael Jackson. Not that one, the other one. And, um, you know, and it would become a thing. It would come back and say, yeah, can you give me 12 hours on it, you know, by, by August bank holiday? And you'd obviously say yes. And then, you know, you'd sort of try and work out what to do. So it's kind of, you know, almost complete reverse with how television is now, you know, where it's kind of micro channels and micro interests and, um, you know, niche upon niche, but also, uh, you know, uh, kind of copy upon copy. Um, I would say there was a difference, though, then. So, you know, the TV hell for me and Gerard are about the same age in our sort of early, mid-50s was when certainly I was a student, that was the mother load, right? Because they're kind of like stuff you cannot see. And as Gerard was saying, things weren't available that you couldn't see. You might have seen them once or heard about them or got them on VHS. And, and TV hell was like a flip of that because it was all the stuff that shit, but interesting. Yeah. And the idea that you could make new stuff out of things people didn't know about or weren't interested in. So there probably were theme nights before, as you mentioned, Gerard. Um, uh, yeah, be going back. It would be a theme that, that might be Mozart night or something. Things that might be kind of very well curated and beautifully written and nice, whereas TV Hell kind of went, certainly for me anyway, oh, there's a, a world out there of things people don't know, yeah. weird records. And if you slightly got the key to the door, and I think we do this on weird now, it wasn't just repeating loads of weird stuff. It's like, go and make something weird. You know, the BBC in 1950s did Elizabethan night, you know, like a theme night to sort of celebrate the arrival of Elizabeth as our queen. And, you know, it was sort of, um, you know, people wearing ruffs and eating, you know, big chicken wings and hail privy and all that sort of thing and it was you know um so you know like anything else is as, as old as the medium itself you know what i mean I mean, that's going back to like 52 i guess um but yes there was a sort of odd conflation of things i think you know there's no new ideas under the sun in, in a sense but at that point i think there was all these people like michael jackson who's like a media studies graduate um you know very conscious of the medium very conscious of its kind of history very conscious of its you know what it could do, that whole kind of cultural studies, you know, generation, that sort of time out limits, you know, identity politics, cultural Marxism, I guess we could now call it, you know, that kind of thinking about culture as, as being one of the places that, you know, power is embedded and, you know, they, they thought very deeply about things that prior to that were just a load of old shite, you know what I mean? Like, so there'd be a pilot, like the classic thing, my favourite thing in TV Hell, which was my first researcher credit, there was... Um, a pilot called Mainly for Men made in the 60s, which was almost like a loaded magazine from the 60s, you know, with a kind of dolly birds dancing to hits at the time. And then, you know, George Best modelling some 
you know, big shirts from his collection or something. And finding that, you know, that, that was a pilot, it kind of aired once, never went out again, because it was rubbish. But if you came at it with a kind of cultural studies, media studies perspective, suddenly that was a, you know, a kind of embodied all of these um, attitudes as Amandu Inucci then very famously and familiarly, you know, parodied the whole kind of thing in, in Attitudes Night, you know. And the sort of tagline for that was, you know, attitudes have changed. Here are some attitudes from the 1950s, you know. And then in the 1960s, there were different attitudes, you know. And it's kind of, you can parody it very easily, but it was new back then because at that point, you know, we do TV hell, you had all these kind of um, BBC people who didn't think that that sort of thing should be on the BBC at all, you know. It was very much as ever the BBC beleaguered and trying to appease its masters who, who then were all, you know, these kind of clubby old Etonian aristocrat people, you know, and the only thing that's changed there is their kind of culture. You know, they're all high culture. didn't think BBC should be doing this stuff. Um, so yeah, it came out of, you know, a bit of that. And also it's just really funny, you know, really funny to see that kind of stuff and to dig that stuff up. And there was acres of it because nobody had bothered with it before, you know, it literally had sat there, since the 60s on watch by anybody. And they were definitely playing with that stuff in uh, the day to day. Uh, I seem to recall they had like the first utterance of swearing on the BBC, uh, you know, obviously fictionalized and uh, public executions and, you know, and, but they were using the old cameras as well. So that was another big reference point for us in Manchester where, so Weird Night was sort of half done in London and half done at BBC Manchester. So the interesting split, not splits, but kind of the two things that I found really exciting at the time as a researcher was there's a kind of a bit more where Gerard had been, the music and arts kind of clever people, and then also the youth department and entertainment. And there was quite an interesting, uh, the, it wasn't even a clash, it was like, oh, okay, there's a way of thinking about things that isn't the standard from both sides. And you from that background, I was more of the, uh, you know, John Ronson and that's what I've been doing and that sort of stuff. We're still thinking about things, but the very much Janet Street Porter's um, thing at that time, of she just left before this, was always innovate. Don't do anything that's been done before. Change it, change it, change it, which is now a cliche, but I worked within that place and it's brilliant. And the people who are doing stuff now is great. And... And it does sort of stick with you. It's like, oh, you could do this, but always think about what is another way of doing something. You know, again, I think it's that pop culture thing because, you know, I was in music and arts, but only because I was, I got a job answering the phone. I was working in a pub and I got a job answering the phone, luckily enough for me, on a program called The Late Show, which was, um, if you think of news night, but about the arts. So it's kind of, um, you know, like a, a, a kind of nightly magazine at 11.15 that, you know, did the issues of the day. So, you know, they had a kind of interview with Salman Rushdie after the fatwa, you know, um, they would do, you know, obituaries of the day because it was live and, you know, all the arts issues there. And then it would have like the Stone Roses, you know, blowing the monitors in the studio uh, famously. That was they the first documentary I ever saw was on The Late Show as well. My my old man taped it for me. It was a special on Batman. Um because the Tim Burton film was coming out, so they did a retrospective on Batman. So if any any of my filmmaking that it, it stems from that that one uh, broadcast because it, it was so different. It was very magazine, um, and but they also dramatized it as well. Those were the early days of dramatizing documentaries, putting actors. They had a guy playing. I think it was John Bird. No, well they had a guy playing um, Frederick Wortham, the the psychologist who. who tried to denigrate comics and stuff well it, yeah and it would do you know it was sort of high you know it was doing sort of it was low culture in high places which i think was slogan of something or should be or maybe i should whatever claim to have coined it you know and again coming out of all that kind of pop culture stuff you know the face and all those things that probably touched stones for everybody that was growing up in the 80s you know it's just amazing to see this kind of you know to see yourself or something you were vaguely interested in reflected back at you you know um, and that was new, you know, and it now, um, I suppose, you know, television is just desperately, not desperately, successfully preempting and creating, you know, that reflection. But back then it was kind of like, as John said, you know, with um, Street Porter, 
you know, it was like literally going on the street and, and, and finding it and saying, look, here's some people doing a thing, you know, and you couldn't do that now because A, they'd be doing it on YouTube or TikTok first and they wouldn't be bothered about you turning up and saying, you know, let me bring you to television because they'd want to know, you know, what the sponsorship deal was and they'd have done it themselves already, you know. But back then you could still go and find these things and sort of bring them to an audience and, and also that audience was there, you know, like Weird Night would have got, really respectable viewing figures because a it was fascinating new great stuff but also there's nothing else to watch do you know what I mean like you pretty much you know you had x number of channels I'm gonna say four um so that was a lot you know what I mean uh which meant you know there was a kind of uh confidence in commissioning because you sort of knew that people were going to watch it anyway and also there was a much more of especially the BBC but across broadcasting at that point everybody had a public service remit. Everybody had a remit where they had to, you know, I mean, it's the BBC was in form, educate and entertain, but, you know, uh, everybody had that written into their contracts, including ITV and, you know, Channel 4, sort of even more so. So, you know, there was a sense of what is this? Why is it interesting? You know, why is it important? And I think that was exciting for me. And I don't know, perhaps you too, John, to be able to say, you know, um, this stuff is important because, you know, not just because I like it, but because it tells us something about the world, you know, that we're, that we're in. And I think that still is true. And, you know, you don't really find it so much anymore because, like I say, you know, you can't assume anyone's going to watch 12 hours of anything, let alone a bunch of, you know, weird Fortean oddities on, on BBC Two. See, I, I, thinking back, I was so excited by the ability, the or the means of production to find weird shit that I liked. It's almost the opposite. I didn't care if anyone liked it. I think that's a lot of the shows that I've made have been like that, you know, the Banzai or whatever. I really like finding the thing that no one knows about in my head because I was going to be the cool one that didn't know, knew about stuff other people didn't because I read certain books or, you know, the research, uh, the research, um, weird video compilations and I really got into that and that was Louis Theroux and Michael Moore and that kind of um yeah, just different ways of doing it wasn't it different, different voices. ways of doing it and it was but personally it was also a kind of I never thought about a kind of public remit I really enjoyed being around that was only John Ronson as well which I had done the year before uh on the Ronson mission um well, we never thought about the audience. We just kind of went, let's just do something as, you know, whatever this makes sense to us in a slightly periodical way. I mean, it's all very arch now, and I have watched one back a couple of weeks ago. It doesn't really stand up, but um, the kind of notion of, right, I've slightly got a hand on the wheels of things that I can do, and it goes out. And that's my little tiny idea as part of that, you know, which is where the ghost watch story will come in, which we will get to, which is a not story. But. Yeah. And I think, you know, and it was small teams, wasn't it as well, John, you know, it was kind of like, you know, kind of punishing schedules and, you know, everything kind of going through a technology of the time, which, you know, had way more stages than it does now. Um, yeah. So it was quite punishing and quite kind of, you know, illegal, I guess, in terms of the hours and stuff. But, you know, it was sort of, it was a sort of nerdy priesthood of that kind of stuff, you know, which um, and I still think, you know, and now obviously, you know, it's a joy because it's available in more places. But, you know, this was, I guess, whatever Tim Berners-Lee had just, you know, done a thing that was going to turn into the internet. You didn't have email. You know what I mean? We had, we had like, we, you know, you had to go to like dusty basements and find these weird compilation, you know, answer me videos from America or... Yeah, you know, answer me, yeah. You know, Church of the, what is it called, John? Church of the... Oh, Church of the Subgenius. Yeah, with the pipe. You know, you'd have to sort of seek that stuff out. The, yeah, the graphic idea. I was always pushing all the Church of the Subgenius stuff and trying to clear it with the Church yeah. of Subgenius for... The, there's a photo of for the for the talk that the, the um uh, not wasn't the race was it the linking bits uh, and I wanted the families with three eyes 
and but trying to contact the church the sub to say can we use this i found incredibly exciting it didn't happen in the end it's where the big baby came about yeah but that for me mad. was like oh my god this is fantastic yeah i suppose you know so it was just that sort of passion and you'd have to have that to drive you through but also i think it was you know it was it was a much as i said before like a much quicker route you know and there were kind of, you know, ways through that too. I mean, it's interesting you talk about dramatization on The Late Show because everybody directed on The Late Show wanted to be a drama director. A lot of them then did become such, um, you know, quite sort of substantial drama directors like Paul Tickell and, you know, Anne Tucker and... Mary Harron. Yeah, Mary Harron, who was absolutely lovely. Like one of the nicest people I've ever met in that kind of junior role. Yeah, meanwhile, at that point in time, I was working with Normsky. A runner, which was very in a similar way. Well, he's a passionate, very, very useful experience. Yeah. What I was going to say was, you know, that drama that, you know, you were so, you know, one of my favorite things about Weird Night is, um, you know, there was a kind of drama at the center of it, which was never supposed to be a drama. It was always funded as a documentary. But Bill Eagles, who's now directing like cop shows in LA and whatever. Um, you know, very successful at it. I think he does CSI, maybe. But um, he just sort of went off and made a drama. Didn't tell anyone. Uh, he was a mate of Spencer Campbell, who was produced, execing the Manchester end of it. But it was just that thing of, you know, you could go off and do your own thing, as John as John said. You know, have your passion, follow it. We were quite junior, you know. Yeah. But still, you know, you could have a sort of direct effect on it because there was so few of you and you'd just be sort of, you know, passing around odd thoughts and um you know and they'd end up on screen and that's um and that's supposed for me i mean um the thing i did i think after that was a kung fu night which again i'd always you know um i'd always sort of been into as a sort of subculture not always been into a subculture it was one of the things i was interested in um and i remember suggesting it and then being told you know well what would that look like as a sort of 12 hour night and you think you know, and at the time you think, okay, well, I'll just go off and write up, you know, what, what I think it should be. Um, and then, of course, you know, it being the BBC, there's also, a, you know, these very erudite men and women who are, you know, experts on Hong Kong film culture. So, you know, that they've got a documentary. And it's just, you know, part of the genius, I think, of a guy called John Whiston, who headed what was the archive unit at that time, then went to take over from Janet in, in Manchester. Um you know, he's very good at managing that system, you know, he's sort of, he's kind of part of it, but he's very good at kind of knowing all the bits to pull together, you know, to make it sort of keep the, what they used to call the sixth floor, sixth floor of the BBC TV centre is where, you know, your big bosses would be. Um, and then behind them, there would be, you know, the sinister cabal of bigger bosses. And then in a secret room off that, there'd be even, bit, you know what I mean? But, you know, he was very good at, managing all that stuff and then so you'd be down at the bottom of that chain kind of having a ridiculous conversation about kung fu or you know um 40 oh, or something and then he would you know his genius was sort of to swing all that together and make it happen and then you'd end up you know with like i don't know kung fu night it went on until six in the morning it was like 18 hours mental but you know but i remember going to uh, Eastern Heroes, because we could license it from there. <laughs> yeah, and again, you bring up. The guy who ran Eastern Heroes and getting in pissed, who was, uh, and it was Ken, uh, Ken, Ken Russell, Russell's son. Ken Russell's son. Ken Russell's son. Yeah. Russell's son, so who Russell basically Russell. at one time had the rights to every single Hong Kong movie ever made. Do you know what I mean? Um, because nobody else was interested. And he sort of, you know, licensed them and bring them into the UK. I went down and met him. Yeah. And hung out with him a bit. I said, oh, yeah, what, what can we do here? It wasn't the BBC Film Acquisition Department. But again, it was that personal passion, John, isn't it, that you've talked about. It's sort of, you know, again, for Weird Night, I'd, um, I, I went to Copenhagen and met this um, expat American who had basically spent the 70s going around all of the closing, you know, flea pit theatres in Times Square and buying up all of their stock. So he had these, like, you know what they used to call kind of, um, you know, like stag do films, which are basically like porn, but like, you know, of, of the era from like the 30s through to the 70s and, you know, and kind of gay porn that was illegal, you know, and they were basically just all sitting in these piles of film cans in these Times Squares, 
you know, flea pits that were being shut down and turned into whatever's, you know, the M&M store or, uh, you know, whatever it is now. Um, and he'd had them, he'd them all in his house. And then he'd kind of gone to Copenhagen because sort of thing you did when you were that kind of guy in the, in the 80s. And I went over there and he just had these piles of, you know, film canisters. And we just sort of spent a couple of days just going through and, you know. And again, it was sort of, you had to do that then. You had to know who that guy was um, and where he was and go and talk to him and meet him and convince him of your, you know, um, good intentions. So, you know, I think that, again, you know, you'd phone him up on the telephone and wait for him, leave him a message on a bit of notepad and then... Bringing people up and chatting them up is a really useful skill. To bring Craig back into it, because all, all roads lead back to Craig Charles for some reason, but it, <laughs> he, he did Red Dwarf as well as Ghostwatch, and famously Red Dwarf yeah. got made by BBC Manchester because it was rejected by BBC London. It so did it get made by BBC Manchester, though. It's badged that it's an independent production. So they never had a production office within the BBC. So it was not going on while we were there in the 90s. There wasn't a, wasn't shot there, there was nothing to do it. So it was sort of a bit like putting a, 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 a Woolsey badge on an Austin Allegro. Well, rebadging a picture. There you go, that's a good reference, isn't it? The Alan Partry, that's just a rebadged. <laughs> it is, it was. So stuff would go out, but it was an independent production. It wasn't. It was, in theory, commissioned out of BBC Manchester, but there was no uh, existence of it for anybody um, who was there at that time. The, the BBC, you think of it as being this kind of licence fee funded body, which for the most part it is, I think it's fair to say, but it is this huge corporate arm where there's lots of syndication and, and what have you. And, and even on Weird Night, you've got an episode of The X-Files in it, which I'm, I can't imagine was, was gifted. Well, that, I mean, the story behind that was, you know, again, because, you know, it had many reasons for, you know, like it wasn't just, didn't just exist because of, you know, some pure creativity or something. You know, BBC2 had bought The X-Files and they wanted to build a kind of big launch night for it so it didn't get lost. So, you know... Uh, that wasn't the sole reason that Weird Night existed, but it was, you know, it helped. It was just one of, you know, one of, and I think in commissioning, that's always the case. It's always, you know, a bit of luck and a bit of judgment and a bit of guile, you know, it, it kind of all, all, all of those things have to come together. So the X-Files thing was effectively, you know, um, the, the sort of engine around which, we, you know, but there was nothing, like now if you did it, you'd do, a three hour reunion, you know, with Mulder and Scully and then bring people on and have them on high stools and James Corden would interview them, you know, um, or you'd have, you know, and of course we did our share of that in theme nights too, you know, like A to Zs or top tens or, you know, things like that. But I think it just speaks well of the BBC and Michael Jackson, everybody involved in it at that point that, you know, to sort of put some propulsion behind a new, you know, cult, um, uh, oh, yeah, very yeah, yeah. show you do all this stuff that really is very very strange very very of itself you know and even within the individual shows you know they're very different I uh, all totally different because mm. you were doing the, uh, the 14 tales weren't you which are very kind yeah, of like like the slow. things which was fucking yeah, a bit more than interstitials they were slow stories I remember we were in the studio yeah, the beating part of the whole night they were the beating heart the whole night, Gerard. Well, they were. If I can, just as a bit of therapy, I spent about six months travelling around. I put ads in papers saying, have you had any weird experiences? And then people would ring up this number. And it was basically like opening, like, talk about portal to hell. I mean, some lovely people, some very genuine people. Yeah, I've um, met some. Yeah, you know, some. but it was me on the road, um, yeah, like just literally driving around the country uh, in a way that I still think now, if I documented it better at the time, would be sort of fascinating because it was kind of, um, you know, because of course 90% of them were UFOs, you know, uh, you know, it would kind of, it was what you'd expect, UFOs, ghosts, you know, things that are very familiar, you know, well-trodden. And of course, the notion was to try and find something that, you know, people people hadn't heard before. And I think we succeeded in that because it was, 
you know, a mixture of who was telling it, their credibility, and also just the odd detail in the story, you know. Um, but it took ages. And again, the idea you'd be allowed that time now to do that is just, or also just allowed to drive around the country on the BBC's um, dime, you know, meeting all these people. I mean, we wouldn't have to either. You'd have Zoom calls with them. A, a, yeah, a phone card and a, a road atlas. Was the, yeah. yeah, you know, and they just... Back in the old days, eh? But yeah, I don't just you, they'd send you off into the night, you know what I mean? And then you come back like, six months later, like if you finished it, you say, Yeah, here it is. They're like, okay, thank you. Um, and again, you know, that isn't you know, things weren't as graded or pre digested, or you know, perhaps the quality control was lower. I don't know, you know, it was more, I think, I kind of think television, I'm not saying this is better. But I think it was different then. I think it was a bit more, you know, artisans and, you know, go off and do your thing and bring it back to us and we will display it on our channel, you know. Whereas I think there's also that, you know, and we were lucky enough to be in an environment that, well, say class-based, we're all mostly, mostly white, but not necessarily straight and not on this. And particularly in BBC Manchester, it was, you talk about the music and arts thing not necessarily Oxbridge, that people didn't have to have gone to a certain university. And particularly under Janet, she kind of didn't, she wanted a mix of a whole load of people and that carried on. That, I mean, my last job for getting to be, I was working in a cat flat factory. It wasn't kind of a, you know, a nice progression through stuff. You blagged your way in, you had to be a bit pushy. The Gerard was, you know, working in the post room those sorts of things and it wasn't you weren't working for much but you were getting paid and it brought a real interesting mishmash of class and education race not so much certainly um sexuality so there were lots of different the people who were doing this were of an age range but they weren't so high banned by the past you know there wasn't the kind of oh this is how it's done and this, it should be done like this. Camp, um, which I really enjoyed at the time. And I, I now sort of cherish it. I don't know if you think the same thing. That you know, the fact the fact that we were that we were there doing this and given slightly the reins of influence on things to a you know to a fair degree, even as researchers or assistant producers, you go, "What are you doing, employing us? We're really, you know we're not the right people to be doing this, but we sort of were." Because we had that curiosity and uh, you know enough intellect to go, oh, someone might find this fun, and by and large, they did. Yeah, and there wasn't that much stuff. I mean, again, you talk about you know Janet; she was doing you know that kind of. I remember South of Watford in the seventies and eighties. Again, you know her and Danny Baker on there. One of the few places you would see anything remotely um, pop cultural, you know, and also that wasn't predigested in some kind of you know improving way um so yeah i think john's john's right that respect. i mean obviously that hasn't sustained and it didn't you know oh. <laughs> it was unusual at the time it's probably you know like you see like well basically all broadcasting reflects the hierarchy way more than it did back then because also i think now people have given up on even the pretext that that's an important thing for them um, so that has changed and i don't know you know like I say, it wasn't necessarily better. It had all its own problems, but I think what we're both alluding to is that kind of freedom to enthuse and, you know, enthuse and then find a sort of a home for your enthusiasm. And also, you know, obviously with that, it wasn't just a kind of, um, uh, I was going to call it something there, but maybe I won't call it that. It wasn't a kind of onanistic thing. You know, it was a massive, you know, there's a huge responsibility and a, a kind of understanding that you'd, find a way to universalize it and make it you know and I think that was part of it too was that you know you're so enthusiastic about it you just wanted to share it you know um which I think is a sort of generous impulse and you know uh, a good one maybe not sharing the Wu-Tang Clan on Kung Fu night that didn't go down well 
You remember I had to go and do that thing with um, uh, Tim Westwood where he couldn't actually do his thing. Well, he was going to bring his posse, wasn't he? And then well, I turned up. One bloke. And he, <laughs> I went, can you, just, can you just do your Tim Westwood thing? He couldn't do it. This is, I literally was to, to just do the thing where you go. Yeah. Like Tim it was a, basically, it was to reflect hip hop's obsession with Kung Fu. It was. was Wu Tang Clan was sort of brand new at that point. And, you know, there was all this kind of. You know, that kind of shared, I don't know how widespread it is now, but, you know, that kind of drawing a line between hip hop as a kind of outsider culture and Kung Fu and they're both doing this kind of similar thing in, you know, in a kind of, anyway, lots of parallels. Of course, it being the BBC, we had to end up with the Bishop of Norwich's son to host it. Although I will stand by him, you know, like Tim Westwood is... No, no, I've got nothing against Westwood. About that music. I, I, He's a white man who's passionate about that music. He's the son of... I, I, have, I have no problem. I, just, I found it odd that he couldn't Westwood, like, do Westwood. He, 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 uh, it took so many takes. Anyway, that's another How story. How force a Westwood? It was supposed to be him and his posse, like, doing links in a studio. Like, nothing hard. Just saying, you know, that was that and this is this, you know? But it, I literally, it was... That was the Foo Schnickins. They've got good style. And I didn't write it for him. Uh, uh, and I couldn't do it. And I went, oh, maybe That, was, that went out quite late, I think. It went out yeah. very late. Well, you sent me to do that with no research on it. Well, it was, you know, easily done, wasn't it? Foo it was, yeah. Good times. On Star uh, Trek night, it's all different because I was uh, not in charge of it, but the... Uh, uh, yeah, again, finding those obscurity things. So, um, I just talked a bit about Kung Fu Night coming up with that. And I was a researcher at the time, and I would really like Star Trek. And I was looking at anniversaries, it was the 30th anniversary. And I rang up because I didn't have any fear then or something. I rang up um, Universal or Columbia, whoever owned it, said, Look, I'm from the BBC. and how about, um, you know, a kind of thing? Could we do this? Because I know the Voyager. And they were trying to push Voyager. And it turned out, serendipity, the BBC had just bought it. So I was like 25. And this, because I liked Star Trek and I spotted this. And then I could go to my, whoever my boss was at the time. And then ultimately John Whiston, who would then go, oh, that's quite cool. And we did kind of like slightly weird arty stuff within it. Like we ended up... Um, interviewing Camille, you know, Star Trek stories. It's people, why they like Star Trek. We interviewed Sean Ryder and Camille Paglia, not at the same time. But that was a sort of the range of things that you could do as these little interstitials. Um, and then a very artsy documentary um, about Star Trek as well. And, um, and then Funk Me Up Scotty, which is the best thing I've ever made. It was my first thing I ever wrote <laughs> and did, uh, which was um, Star Trek stuff presented by John Peel. So I've actually never done anything better than that. But I thought when I was 25, oh, I've had this idea so I could do this 15 minute thing. And I did. So I'm, I'm really happy you know, there came, a ch there came a change because all of those things, you know, from, and then there was a kind of glut of them, I have to say. There were things, you know, we did, we did one, I didn't work on it, we did one about Mars, you know, the importance of Mars in our culture, um, H.G. Wells, uh, do you know what I mean? And it well, I did Politically Incorrect Night, which was literally Attitudes Night. Yeah, about stuff. And then I remember, like, the last... So basically, that was all context, if you like. It was all about what's the context to see these things anew in. You know, how can we reinterpret? And again, uh, you know, I mean, modern reviews around at the time. I remember them doing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You know, as a kind of allegory of capitalism or whatever. You know, it's and it's true, but also it's parodic because you know because it's written this kind of slightly ironic way. You find yourself, you know, you could sort of just change the noun basically. Um, so. What happened then was there was a kind of change away from context to completely context free, which kind was the I loves and the top tens. Whereas yeah, that's just true. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, you know, just nostalgia without context. Um, yeah, just remembering I love, you know, Spangles remember that, which, you know, has been, again become parodical. But the theme nights weren't 
weren't the I loves. Yeah, it was kind of theme nights for all context and the I love context. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All fun and no facts. You know what I mean? And that I think kind of, you know, I don't know, but you know, and that stuff still goes on. Um, those kind of are, you know, but I think definitely the shift happened there that I don't know where all the analysis went. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's like don't be too clever anymore. Just go, hey, remember. Yeah. probably onto sites like yours you know what I mean like it became like whatever the 90s version of you know chat rooms and uh you know sort of special interest groups and forums and things you know it was kind of start of all that it sort of went back to that and and the kind of context-free fun stuff lives on you know there's like well we see it all the time don't we we see a kind of celebration of x y and z you know um which it's just part of the culture now, isn't it? It's part of our, you know, our culture is that sort of eternal present, isn't it? You know, there is no past or future. It's just here. It's all here at once. You just kind of pass it up chunks of it as you wish. Um, and that's a sort of, you know, it's a thing, isn't it? I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but it's a thing that has happened. Um, and that wasn't, you know, and that I think is the biggest difference between then and now is that, this stuff didn't have, you know, it didn't have a context, it didn't have a home really. It was sort of, you know, all these disparate strands and the joy of those nights was bringing all that stuff together and sort of showing it to a giant audience, you know, like five million people watching um, Funk Me Up Scotty or Tim Westwood failing to, you know, do links or, or better than that, you know, a kind of history of Kung Fu and what it meant in popular culture or a history of the... Kung Fu is, it's great though. Yeah, so it's sort of, you know, that has gone probably, you know, and it's gone because the technology's changed and the kind of culture's changed. But, you know, I think it did a lot to bring about something important. I don't know what that is. Otherwise, I'd be very rich. But, uh, you know, it's really... Well, there was no money in it, that's for sure. Well, not for us, John. Not for us. Is there a reason the BBC hasn't been repeating a lot of this stuff, that you have to find it on YouTube now or...? I think rights is part of it because I remember, you know, in the early days you'd go in, you would, um, the BBC, well, the bigger context of it is, you know, basically rights happened the, as, the, you know, in the kind of times of when Dad's Army was being wiped because they wanted to use the tape again to record, you know, the snooker or something. Uh, and only exists now because David Croft went down and actually paid for the tapes out of his own pocket. Um, you know, there was no there was no interest in that kind of stuff, and so nobody knew anything about rights. You know, David Croft effectively uh, on, owns those rights because you know, of course, he, he produced it. You know, he and Jimmy Perry kind of created it, but largely it's because he owns the material. You know, because back then nobody knew or thought there was anything in it. You know, you'd get your five pound, ten shilling check from the BBC to do your thing, um, whether you were Harold Pinter or you know, whatever. Um, on a scale. Yeah, and that changed because, you know, as TV becomes globalised and BBC Studio sets up, I mean, there are stories of, you know, like BBC Studios when they open in the sort of 80s, 90s, sort of ringing people up and saying, do you own the rights to this show? In all these kind of surprise producers, you know. Oh, come and on. And anyone's kind of going, yes. And then suddenly this torrent of cash comes in, you know, because all these new channels open up, gold, whatever, you know, Only Fools and Horses is on 10 times a night. And if you are those people who own only fools and horses and you know you can get a trillion pounds to do full repeats of the whole season 27 times on gold, if me or John comes along or the equivalents and say, you know, I want to do a compilation show, so I, I don't need that. I'm not interested in, I can't be bothered. You know, so rights became a massive issue. It became more expensive. Um, all the talent unions, like equity, whatever, start to see the value in repeat fees. So they became more of a thing. You know, talent costs soared as more channels came along and there was, you know, more place you could go. It wasn't just a case if the BBC said, no, you were done. You know, now you could go somewhere else. And then BBC would think, oh, shit, I need that person. I'm going to, you know, there's a kind of huge, huge increase in the costs associated and also the complexity of dealing with it. Um, so I think that's a large part of it. And also I think, you know, it's that niche thing. It's sort of... Um, a worry about 
the nicheness of doing a certain thing, you know? And, and I, I think then a niche and broadcasting terms was quite big. Be it Kung Fu, weird people who wanted an alternative because there's nowhere else to go. So then a niche, a new thing, could probably draw people in. Um, now you can find your niche wherever you like. There's a hell of a lot of niches. Yeah. And they don't you know, either. Uh, and that, that you can, you can f you know, if you're into these half dozen things, you can find an outlet for it or a piece and buy the DVD. Was I, I, th I think I do, do remember at the time the kind of notion that if something had been on once, you'd never see it again unless you recorded it. And that was sort of, you know, growing up in the 80s with that, with, you know, didn't we have a VHS that, like Ghostwatch, you kind of went, I remember it going out, going, oh, I've never seen that. Like, you know, and, it, and it still never has been repeated. If you want to see it, you can see it. But the difference between that being put out on national TV um, as a play that people got into, that moment can't happen again. You know, that's the context of the show and the broadcast. I mean, obviously, you know, well, and then feeding into little bits on the stuff we were doing. If you were showing a Kung Fu movie that's never been on, they've never put Drunken Master on BBC Two before. Or never put William Shatner, that a tape I got from Merv Griffin's widow that she found in a cupboard. It was that kind of VHS tape. That's not going to happen anymore. And it was that, um, you go, well, can it show it what? You know, yeah, they've never no, been it seen. Was. And if you remember, you know, back then the BBC, you know, the stick that was used to beat the BBC up was, it was repeats, you know, it was kind of repeat was a dirty word, you know, there was no classic anything, you know what I mean? It was, it was just old. It was kind of, and again, if you've got three channels on and they're only really on from like, you know, 6 p.m. to 11.30, if, uh, you know, you, you, you're going to kick off if there's something repeated on there, basically. Uh, Weird Night was the first one coming out of BBC Manchester and uh, partially Music and Arts in London. Then they got with a taste for it. And uh, there was another one called Best Night about George Best. When they famously, he was going to do the links. Of course, he didn't. And they, it was just cut to an empty chair in the pub in his um, place in Chelsea. So it was a night all about George Best. And that was, uh, I didn't work on that. But if you know people like football and George Best, that was quite interesting. So there was an appetite for these kind of slightly wonky event programmes off the back of Weird Night. Um, Star Trek Night was because I was had, I wasn't staff, but whatever, I was kept on the books. I was only a researcher. And the 30th anniversary was coming up and I loved Star Trek, still do. And um, without being a super Trekkie, but like the sort of oddness around it. And notice the 30th anniversary of the first episode was coming up. So it would have been 96. Uh, and sort of wrote something up, pitched it to whoever was my sort of line manager at the time. Went, okay, well, if you can, it, I think, if, yeah, if you can ring up um, uh, Universal, I think it was, and see if they've got any interest, then let's see. And again, you sort of would pick up the phone to people and sort of did and got a bit of traction there. And it turned out the BBC was just buying Voyager and they were pushing Voyager. So they were sort of helpful. So um, very similar, you know, similar to Weird Night. Then you kind of go oh, from, from one little thing that you're interested in. And I was, I was you know, quite junior at the time. But we'd been taught or not taught but encouraged to be a bit precocious and come up with stuff and um and then three months later you go okay well you know this might happen and john whiston would have been who was the head of the department of bc manchester at the time had gone gerald was talking about before had access to the bbc and he probably went oh yeah that's quite a good thing do you think that's a good idea johnny went yeah that's a good idea and um uh, it, they rated well, didn't it? Really quickly from there. I don't know what it rated. I never really looked at that. 
No, they did. And I think that was, I mean, it wasn't a surprise, but it was certainly obviously a, you know, a sort of welcome thing for the network. It was a kind of, you know, it just became, you know, it was for a while there, it was a sort of guarantee because it felt fresh and it felt different and it was, you know, it made a splash. Um, so yes, that they started to sort of commission a lot of them, um, kind of around you know like august bank holiday was always a big moment on christmas you know points points when people have got a bit more time and when the schedules are less um uh busy i'll put it that way uh, you know a niche was then big mm. in a way you know in, in a mainstream world niches could be quite big for broadcasting whereas now niches are smaller do you recall how um craig charles became involved uh to be the narrator or the host? I don't recall how that came about. Um, because they were always ex- sort of sort pseudo lot. experts in the field or mm. whatever the topic was. And I know that Craig's a big site, even though he's in science fiction as an actor, he, he yeah. has quite a big repertoire as a you know, sci fi yeah, fan. I, I don't a- recall how that came about. And I think it was fairly last minute. I think I wanted Shatner to do it. <laughs> I was just always on the phone to Shatner's agent. Um, uh, and if you can't get Shatner, get Craig Charles. Well, they have kissed, so there's always a connection between the two. And there was a second Star Trek night as well. I think it's interesting that the first one was, the first Star Trek night was preceding Voyager. The second Star Trek night was preceding Enterprise. Ah, yeah. And I think Jonathan Ross hosted that one. That's right, yeah. So did you did you have a hand in that, John? Or was that... I did. No, I I left the I left the BBC by then. Did the BBC do another Star Trek night. They did apparently. Yeah, that's a bit extra, isn't it? I know. Well, wow. uh, yeah. He. I mean, Jonathan Ross, obviously. You know, again, king of the enthusiasm, king of the kind of cult and the collection, and you know all of that stuff. I mean, he was, you know. He, he, he was on Star Trek night as a, um, we did this thing called Star Trek stories, which totally taken from weird night where you had people talking about things, but it was like why they liked Star Trek. Real stars that they trekked on. <laughs> yeah, but just kind of, I mean, it's, 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 in fact, Franklin did it, another friend of ours. He, he was doing this and it was like the weirdest bunch of people. It was like Henry Rollins. No, sorry, Henry Rollins, that was something else. But it was um, Jonathan Ross, uh, uh, Sean Ryder and Kermit from Black Grape talking about why they like Star Trek and Camille Paglia talking about how much she loved Data <laughs> and why Data was like so, so sexy from a feminist point of view so it's obviously that's a sort of odd you know an example of those strange things that could happen we go oh we've got Camille Paglia so no one went no you can't have her on that doesn't work so she's doing this really intellectual bit about data. And she did a kind of little two-minute essay on data. And then Sean Ryder and Kermit um, in a full black grape mode, also being equally enthusiastic about Spock in a different way. So you get that kind of nice, you know, little juxtapositions could pop up, things that shouldn't be on and sort of do, but do make sense within a, uh, a broader theme but well, made sense I don't think it made sense but it's reflecting the audience as well in a strange way because because it's so narrow when you've only got four channels say um, that you're going to get lots of different takes on it simultaneously whereas now as you say it's more niche you know people tune in to see what they want when they want where they want and you have I mean I remember Star Trek night as a kid we were on holiday did you watch it yeah I, I saw as much of it as I could we we got to a B&B late somewhere it was Ramsgate or somewhere and um the, it, the whoever ran the place allowed us to have the TV on uh, they went to bed and me and the old man went downstairs and watched a bit of Star Trek night and it was fantastic so it's strange that it, it, it's it's much like as you said with Ghost Watch that people have these sort of strange memories of them that are almost you almost question whether you saw it I'd love to just, I'd love for the beep to open up the archives somewhat, if they could. I know it's tricky. 
but it would be interesting. And that is, is it fair to say that you ha- that's where the ghost watch thing came in is, you know, as far as archives were concerned, was, was the situation slightly different? Should we tell the story or? Well, as I remember it, uh, on Weird Night, where I was a fairly junior researcher on it, um, I was asked to come up with ideas to put in the 12 hours of programming that could go on kind of horror films. I've already plugged in a bit to the 14 times and the research books and the psychotronic video guide. Not that I had any possessions or video player or anything, but uh, obviously Ghostwatch is something that's stuck in my head. I have a recollection of what ordering it up from the library and watching it in full as a proposal to put in to uh, to the night, where it was you know, a bit of a free for all. Basically, you know, I was also in a bit like Gerard in the archive. You partially the archive unit would just get a researcher and go go and find out loads of stuff about this. You got a week, and that used to be like going to the film library, uh, the library, or the archive, or um, go and look at loads of microfiche or something. Um, which I enjoyed, and I, I remember ordering up, getting it, watching it, and in my head we had rebroadcast some of it. Um, turns out I was wrong when I looked at the uh, lineup for the night. I also then, as you, when I was speaking to you, Richard, reminded me that I found out for the first time things that were embargoed that could never be broadcast again. When you try and order it up, there's a kind of a question mark about it. Like you can't, you have to take the tape back. It had like special details on it, this VHS. Like, you know, it wasn't just normal library tape. Um, so it, it was never broadcast. I think I tried to get it rebroadcast only four years later. So it'd be 92 it was broadcast, and this is 96. And the only other example I've come across of this was in my constant efforts thereafter to get the uh, Brit Awards with Sam Fox and Mick Fleetwood used in some way, similarly embargoed, no reasons given. They just, when you, when you ask the question, uh, it's, it's not going to happen. Because also then you could just order stuff up. You could order up VHS with no internal charging. And if you're working in the arc, you know, doing archive or, accessing stuff just big trucks would arrive full of vhs's and one inch tapes and i was very happy so ghost watch uh, was not was a candidate to be part of it but it never happened yeah. what do you remember gerard if i totally misremembered that i know no i it was definitely on the list of things it was a strange beast the bbc at that point because you know they, they didn't want controversy no um, they were, you know, I remember having conversations or having to write memos to, you know, lady, uh, you know, a handbag, what's her name? Lady Bracknell types at the BBC on the sixth floor, you know, about why the BBC should be broadcasting Kung Fu. <laughs> and it's kind of, you know, and it's sort of surreal, but it, there still is that sort of hangover of, um, you know, there's a royal unit, probably still is. So anything involving the royals had to be cleared by the royal liaison officer. Um, you know, it was the BBC sort of doing its due diligence to, I suppose, protect the, um, you know, what it felt it needed to protect, whether it's the public or uh, the royal family or whatever. But yeah, there was a lot of, um, you know, and it was never, and it being the BBC as well, it was never like, no, you can't. It was always kind of, no. it was very sort of, if you can give me an intellectual justification why this should happen, you know, it was very much like, uh, yes, you know, it was kind of very couched in those establishment terms of, um, you know, it wasn't yes or no. It was sort of like, well, do you think the BBC, you know, do you think the BBC should be involved in this sort of, and, you know, and your answer would obviously be as an oik, as me and John were, would be, yeah, but that wasn't the right answer. You know, the right answer is, well, you know, I've talked to, you know, Lord who are and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's all about that, really. It's very old establishment, you know. Um, anyway, but that was one way through the BBC at that point. Probably still is. Probably is the way through the world, which is why we are where we are. 
But the Ghost Watch thing, I think de definitely at the time, it was like, why is the BBC doing this? You know what I mean? Why is the state broadcaster, which it isn't, but, you know, effectively doing a thing that is just this oddity? And that was, I think, what we were up against all the time and all of these kind of things was, um, you know, why on earth should the BBC be doing this? Because you'll always bring the BBC into disrepute, and that hasn't changed. There's nothing the BBC does that won't bring it into disrepute because... You know, That's worse, people, yeah. you know, people of a certain political persuasion or, you know, people who've got large investments in different ways of broadcasting, you know, they're going to find the disrepute, whatever you do. So it's always been a kind, you know, and even then, I think that was that was amping up at the time. You know, Sky was about to launch, you know, Sky's whole kind of initial sort of sales pitch was, you know, it was like all the things the BBC is not allowed to do and yada, yada. And it was just at that point, John Burke was... It was producer choice and just come in. Yeah. 95. Because I, I remember the bit of the overlap, not that I was a producer, but the kind of that suddenly like all internal charging for getting tapes from the archive. The basic market system, you know, basic internal market, which back then was, you know, fiercely. Like internal market, yeah. Yeah, it was like fiercely opposed by, you know, and again, it's good and bad. I'm not saying it was all bad, you know, that kind of establishment way that it was run that very sort of oxbridge college you know uh high table approach you know it gave us a lot of amazing things and also probably gave a lot of um social mobility or a lot of you know it's very sort of um liberal in, in in you know in a good way um that's, that's yeah, my reflection was that establishment you know and i think that was the thing like ghost watch was gonna bring the bbc to disrepute so you know but of course they couldn't ever say that because then you could challenge that, uh, you know, with your whatever high table verbal jousting debate skills. Um, so, you know, it just sort of, you'd get this kind of strange BBC. And I think that's where a lot of that kind of conspiracy stuff comes from. It's not really conspiracy. They're just people who, for whatever reason, think the BBC will suffer if this goes out again, um, decide to release it. But of course, not releasing it itself becomes a stick to beat the BBC with, uh. you know. They, they literally cannot win, do you know what I mean? Well, I suppose, but that was the joy of it, wasn't it? I mean, I yeah, suppose what was, yeah. what was terrifying was the liveness, wasn't it? You know, and if you watch your DVD, like, you know that this isn't literally happening in front of you. You know, it's like a DVD is happening in front of you. I don't know if it's the older that I get, but nostalgia seems like a shorter distance. Yeah. So with, with Ghostwatch, um, I was seven when I watched it. Um and then there was a period, where, and we actually had a tape of it. Uh, my the old man taped it. He would tape everything, so we had a tape of it. And even the tape scared me because I'd made a different sort of ghost watch in my head. And then I eventually rewatched it, um, and still found it unsettling. And then there was a big long period where I didn't watch it at all. And it's almost like reappraising something at different parts of your life for some whatever reason it must be a tuning fork for me but ghost watch still works it hasn't really run out of steam and that when we do the national science thing every year the, the thing that's most encouraging to me it's not just the sort of you know crazed praise of it that you get from certain people including myself but it's the, the odd person that says are they repeating it that will happen. Somebody won't be in the know and they'll get the phone out and see like a long list of tweets about Ghostwatch and say, what channel's it on? What channel's it on? And we'll have to say, no, you have to get your DVD or, you know, whatever. Um, so there's definitely an appetite for, for some of this stuff that I think transcends nostalgia. But um, the root of it is how you felt at the time. And that doesn't necessarily have to be a, a good thing or a bad thing. You might just want to see what it's like, what it feels like now. Has it changed? Has, has, and you can you can use that to measure the kind of metrics of the BBC and, and other broadcasters because I, I can't quite recognise what the BBC are doing at the moment in terms of their output. It made more sense to me when I was younger. <laughs> the fair bit of stuff that I enjoy, but I don't set the timer anymore, sadly. And no I, one does. That's the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know... And I suppose that was, you know, kind of long before streamers, you know, we were kind of rediscovering this stuff. And I, I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? Because in theory, that you know, the logic of it is now that anything you want is available to you, dependent on whether you want to, you know, pay 
Disney for access to all of their catalog forever or pay, you know, like it's all available now, isn't it? As a kind of, um, or a bootleg version is probably available somewhere on YouTube or on some, you know, Lithuanian, whatever site. But um, I suppose part of the nostalgia is that shared experience of it, isn't it? Like you talked about your own kind of personal, you know, your dad recording it and, and what have you. And I think that's obviously gone now, isn't it? Because you can kind of dip in and out of, of anything, anywhere, anytime, really, more or less. Uh, although I know, like, you know, you look at Kaleidoscope, those kind of groups that I'm still a member of on Facebook. Yeah, and, so, yeah, yeah. you know, they're still furious that, you know, the um, ads or whatever, you know, the, the weather from 1972 isn't, you know, available in some form. I'm sure it is. I'm sure you know, that won't be far off, you know, as, as every network turns into a streamer, and it doesn't matter to them either way, you know, like there's no reason at some point in the near future that you or any viewer couldn't become like you are if you are now an archive researcher, you know, where you kind of log straight into the BBC's database and watch what you want, you know, and if that is weather broadcast from 1972 or Death Watch, sorry, Death Watch, Ghost Watch or Death Watch, whatever that is, should be a show. Um, you know, you can do that. Of course, that will dissipate, won't it? So if you're, if you're sort of idly doing that after your dinner on a Tuesday, that will very much be a different experience than remembering your dad recording it or remembering being on holiday and watching Star Trek night or something. You know, I think that obviously is gone. It's banal, but that kind of shared experience or, or even unique experience is gone. You know, you don't stumble across things anymore. Or you do if you're choosing to, you know, and that still is that. I mean, that's still my joy on YouTube is finding brick lane videos that I've yet to watch and there aren't many but I find them but you know it's th things that and again it's or, 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 uh, Russian rave videos yeah exactly and I think it's you know probably myself and John also share and I think at the time a lot of people did you know that nerdery around records or or whatever or bands and stuff you know and now it's all there isn't it and of course it must dissipate it if you don't have to spend your pocket money on it and go to a shop and rave you know the snooty teenage shop assistant and buy a record that you know you can only play at home because they don't have in-store listening posts or anything like that you know that then becomes a much bigger investment you know like in every way for you and probably becomes more important to you and you know that obviously has gone in terms of content um and i suppose in a way that should make all of those things and they probably do individually make those things more valuable um and more bespoke but I don't know maybe in time that'll dissipate too you know when it's all available everywhere all the time we'll just I don't know what we'll do really it's not Which bad the of ghost watching away probably don't push for it to be repeated keep it special, what? Keep, it special. Keep, keep a bit of a shimmer around it I mean at this rate it will probably it's the 30th anniversary next year at the time of recording this and I imagine it will be one of the few shows that hasn't been repeated ever and people are so surprised I remember Kim we interviewed Kim Newman and he said BBC4 Channel 4 no you know it's, you, yeah, it's, it's, BBC it's BBC such a kind of pull oh, let's let's rush and get something that hasn't been shown yet well but, maybe it's um, still got the embargo curtain around it like me yeah, well, it probably doesn't, you know, I mean, again, I'm sure if it goes out now, you know, it's not going to bring the BBC down because other things will bring the BBC down. I mean, do you know, it's funny too, and there is, you know, and there's definitely a kind of track in that culture thing. I mean, I put together a Doctor Who night, um, again, based on the fact that they discovered an episode in Australia and that was the hook for it, you know, never been seen before. And it was a Pertwee episode, I can't even remember. Was that after I left? Uh, that would have been before the I Loves kicked in. So, um, and I didn't get to, I didn't get to make it because I was working on I think old ETV at that point. Oh right, yeah. But I remember doing the proposal, and that was partly because um, in the archive unit you get besieged, you know, in a, not in the loveliest way, but you get calls all the time. You know, they bring up and ask the archive unit, and the library didn't want to deal with them, didn't really understand. So you get these like amazing folks, some of whom then went on to you know actually work there. Um, who were, you know, Whovians and absolutely obsessed. And that was at a point, you know, like early 90s, I'm guessing, you know, Doctor Who's done and dusted and it's sort of, 
you know, and they were like the ultra nerds, you know what I mean? They were like super organized and super kind of diligent. And they had the same question, which is why aren't you showing old Doctor Who's, you know? And there wasn't really an answer other than, oh, you know, you're, that's old stuff. We don't like old stuff. And I'm, you know, and I'm, not, I'm not remotely um, laying claim to any of this, but, you know, um, what I think, you know, obviously what, what then happens is Doctor Who is seen as a sort of part of tradition and part of something the BBC, you know, should be doing. I'm sure in part because of this whole kind of nostalgia thing that we were, you know, very much a part of. Um, and then they bring it back and, you know, and I remember at the same time, um, being at the BBC in Manchester where they made Mastermind and Mastermind was cancelled for the briefest time, for about a year it was cancelled. You know, cause it's kind of like, well, this has run its course. You know, the BBC's obligation is to, you know, bring new things to the fore and blah, 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 blah. And then somebody else, you know, wiser, they actually cancelled One Man and His Dog as well, which is sacrilege. But, you know, it's kind of, there's just this notion that it's old, it's done, it's had its time. You know, who's going to be interested in Doctor Who? The answer is every fucking buddy in the whole world, you know, is interested in Doctor Who. And now it's, you know, it, again, it's probably a touchstone for as many people who are entering maybe their 30s now, you know, from that kind of second um, attempt at it. But it's just different times, you know, different times, different sort of agenda, different kind of notion of what the BBC should have been doing. Um, so, you know, it can change and it can change very quickly. And it, you know, I can't imagine Ghostwatch has the same qualities though, you know, as a Doctor Who, like a, it doesn't have a regenerating character who can just pop up anywhere, does it? But, um, what pipes? I'm sure Sarah Green would turn up, wouldn't she, for a reboot? I've absolutely no idea. I'd like to think so. I'd like to think that. Why don't um, you make it rich? Why don't you get your get your Apple? You know, get your iPhone ten and just film it. It'll be nine hundred times better technically than, than <laughs> the original one. <laughs> and you can do it on Zoom. Found footage, isn't it? It's a found footage is a sort of, you know, it's a it's a very stand well it's pretty much a standard genre thing now isn't it for um... it wasn't found footage it's the it's all the like alan partridge used it all the kind of narrative of mm. the show and the cameras dipping down and the lights and you see so you know the fourth wall's not broken but you kind of break the light entertainment yeah do you remember there was um you might know rich i can't remember it I once had to um, collate, it was such a weird job, but I was once, I had to do a, a collate, a play for today's season. Um, yeah, which, you know, like you'd, you'd assume that that would be like Judy Dench and, you know, <laughs> and would get together and do that. It was me watching old play for today's and sort of saying, well, that's a good one. And of course, I mean, look, there were obviously other, other people then reviewing whatever. But, um, and as part of that, a bit like John, you know, you'd kind of just sit down in a room for like 12 hours a day watching yeah. VHS tapes or like, you know, film and what have you. And there's one there, it was basically, it was, a, it was um, a horror kind of play and it was about somebody a bit like Doctor Who who went mad on the set of Doctor Who. And part of the premise was, you know, there was sort of the cameras carried on and captured him doing his madness because he'd gone into, and then it, you know, and, then, and the, the wheel within the wheel was, there was actually a kind of supernatural reason that he turned based on a storyline, you know, so it's kind of probably right of your street in a way, um, very of its time. And I'm not sure I'm going with that, but you know, but that whole kind of notion of that, found, as John says, that found footage or the interstitial bits, that again was one of the joys of archive was just finding those bits. Or one of my favorites was Generation Game. Like you'd get these giant old tapes of Generation Game. And of course they'd start recording because literally the valves would have to warm up on the cameras and on the recording machines. You know, you couldn't just, it wasn't digital. It wasn't just like, you know. Um, so literally these things would pre-record. So you'd have like 10 minutes of, um, you know, like Bruce Forsyth in rehearsal, or you'd have like just, you know, the bits before um, newsreaders went on air. And Adam Curtis made an absolute um, aesthetic out of that. 
you know, the bit before the bit kind of thing, you know, the 10 seconds before they think they're going into record mode. That's when you get, you know, the, all the kind of oddness and the staring into camera, you know, and the kind of, you know, the bits that like break the normal narrative of what, you know, people do and still do on television in terms of looking down the lens or smiling to the cat, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think there's a definite joy in that. And it's also, and they do feel eerie. Like I do remember it felt like almost um, very intimate and very strange to be sat in a dark room watching Bruce Forsyth uh, not know he was on camera. Because part of the time he's just chatting with his then wife, who was, you know, his... Um, Anthea. Bird. What's her name again? Anthea Turner? Was it that Yeah. Right? No, no, no. Anthea. Well, Anyway, Anthea, Anthea. It felt really, well, Anthea. really intimate. And I think that is one of the joys maybe of Ghost Watch is that intimacy of people being recorded when they don't think they are. If, you know, it feels kind of, it still, I think, feels um, forbidden slightly and, and very intimate in a kind of strange, slightly unnerving way. But in a way, the way that the latest part of Adam Partridge has sort of used a bit of ghost watch maybe or not or yeah well, the set designer worked on ghost watch richard drew um so there's a bit of a a crossover well i suppose and again i wonder if that all that aesthetic has gone now in the world of zoom when we've all seen each other picking each other's you know noses and scratching ourselves you know what i mean like intimacy is probably i don't know though i mean the biggest show on e4 was the live stream from the big brother house which was largely people asleep that was their show for years i like that the idea of loads of people sat at home watching somebody sleep is fucking creepy as hell. But you kind of understand it, can't you? But they were going like, we're going the Andy Warhol. Oh, it's a bit Andy. That was their yeah. intellectual justification. Oh, we're being a bit Andy Warhol or something. Yeah. You know? yeah. Or science, science justification as opposed to, uh, it's just quite fun watching someone sleep. Good times. All right, Rich, are we all good? Um, yeah, lovely, it was a real joy actually, a real pleasure. Thank you, John, for including me in, and thanks, Rich, for you know organizing it. It's all. been a real pleasure, thank you. Well, I hope it helps. I hope we didn't libel anybody, or no, I don't we did libel anybody quite, quite. We'll say, well. fucking bugger. I hope we didn't do that. Get ready to hide behind the curtains. Next on to, it's the long-awaited dramatisation of Dr. Lynn Pascoe's unsettling account of the North Old Poltergeist. Angels of the Odd. <laughs>